My name is Steve Walensky, and I'll be moderator for this event. Um, I'd like to talk to you about a few of the uh, thoughts that the organizing committee had uh, in mind for this. Uh, we know that uh, this is something uh, on the minds of many. Uh, you can't avoid school safety issues in the news almost every day. Uh, we hope people will remember a couple of things. One is that we're all here for basically the same reasons. We love our kids, we love our grandkids, we want the safest possible school. And that's a point of unity for all of us. Uh, in the national debate, there are all kinds of different ideas about how to get there. And that's all right. In a democracy, that's, that's how we live. Uh, so tonight, we hope for several things. Number one, that we will limit our discussions to things that we here in Calaveras County can do something about. Uh, there are many issues that can be dealt with in Sacramento and Washington, but we have things that are within our capacity to do to make our schools safer, and that's the subject of tonight's meeting. Uh, secondly, uh, while there is a lot of history in this, in this school district and a lot of personal relations, uh, tonight we'll be an, uh, talking about the issues. Uh, not the people. Uh, we, we hope people can keep within that. And I guess there's one last thing. Uh, Martin Luther King did mention uh, that we all were blessed with two ears and one mouth. Uh, and it was his hope that we could use them in that proportion. Uh, tonight, we hope that there'll be a lot of listening, uh, as well as the uh, right, as exercising the right to speak your mind. So with that in mind, we've got several different uh, features to this meeting. First, you get a panel of amazing experts. Uh, <laughs> well, yes. And, uh, <laughs> and each, each with a different discipline and different perspective on safety. Because we know this is a multifaceted issue. The solution isn't just one or another thing. There are a lot of different arenas that we can act on. Uh, secondly, we're hoping that if you have any questions, if they haven't explained everything you need to hear from them, uh, there will be a question and answer period specifically to the panel uh, at, to help uh, give a little more detail, uh, put a little meat on those bones. The third uh, part of this meeting will be all yours. Uh, anybody who has anything to say on the subject is welcome to do so. All we ask is that, to allow everybody a chance uh, that you limit your comments to two minutes. Um, and finally, and in my mind, the most important aspect of tonight, we would like this to just be a beginning. This is a chance to learn something, to express ourselves, but what we do will be how we'll be remembered. And so you will find that each of you has, I hope, been given a card, and there are several different uh, subject areas that we think we can do some things uh, about here in Calaveras County. And we hope that you will join us in moving from the discussion to actual action by the end of this meeting and sign up for one of those. There are six possibilities already posted in the lobby. Uh, if you have other ideas and want to add other areas of activity, please let that be known and that will be posted as well. Uh, so in the end, uh, let's get active behind our ideas. Uh, thank you for being here and we'll start with our sheriff, uh, Rick DiBasilio. So you can, you go, you'll be able to go back and get this PowerPoint presentation. Um, so I'll go through it. Um, can you, uh, in the booth, hit the lights? Uh, can you go to the second page, please? Okay, that's an overview of the Calaveras High School. And basically what it says is we've been asked, what has the Sheriff's Office done for uh, our local school safety, and what do we plan to do? Um, we have a lot of things in plan, and a lot of that is inside of this program that you'll see. Next slide. Okay, between law enforcement and the schools, our goal is to establish procedures to be followed when an incident involving the acts of violence takes place and that the school administration has knowledge of what plans and tactics law enforcement may use to resolve the situations. And this isn't just for active shooters. This is for any critical incident that involves the schools. It could be another fire that we have where we have to evacuate the school. It's still a critical incident. So we work with the schools to put these plans together so that when something like this happens, we've already got the plan, we already know what we're going to do and how we're going to respond to it. Next slide. 
Uh, this talks about my uh, school resource officer, Sean Cicchini. He's here with me tonight. Um, we're planning on putting another uh, school resource officer into the program in uh, July when the kids come back to school. So we'll have two. Um, the, uh, the government, through a, a, an assembly bill, is actually putting together a program to where they're going to theoretically, and don't quote me on this, but they're supposed to be putting together a program to where they are going to make more funds available for schools in order to put more counselors in the schools, and they're going to be able to give the sheriff's office and local munip municipalities more funds to put more school resource officers into our schools. So um, I've been following that really close. Um, I know the California State Sheriff's Association, um, which I am part of, is very involved in getting that legislation passed. So right now, um, I am making sure that our schools are safe. And as Kate said and, and um, Steve said, we all have kids in school. I have a daughter that here still goes to this school. So my safety is for everybody. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's a very relevant thing right now. Um, some of the things that the uh, school resource officer uh, deals with here in the schools, um, fighting amongst juveniles, narcotics, um, attacks by students on school staff, vandalism, sexual assaults, child abuse that's in the home and it transfers out to the schools, um, and bruises on kids from the child abuse that's in, in the home. So the school resource officer is very busy position when it comes to the schools. Um, a lot of folks may not understand, but our county has 19 schools in it. Two of them are in Angel's Camp, and Angel's Camp deals with those schools. So the sheriff's office covers the rest of the county. So the SRO that we have is now covering 17 schools, and it, it's, it's a lot. Um, I did it for three and a half years. It's a lot to cover, especially when you have a high school with 950 or so kids in it. Um, you have a continuation, you have a couple of continuation schools down here. Those schools tend to have more activity. So unfortunately, it pulls away from our elementary schools and even our middle school keeps us busier because it has 600 something kids in it. So adding the second school resource officer is going to assist in that. Um, and as funding comes available, we'll continue to add resource officers as we feel we can. Um, calls after school hours that deputies handle, the SRO does do the follow-up on that uh, when it involves the school or kids. Um, juvenile law and adult law are kind of like two different worlds. Uh, there's a whole, whole lot of difference. Um, let me move, move forward on this or I'll talk all night on this. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, we do coordinate with the allied agencies. Um, SARB is a school attendance review board. Um, the uh, district attorney, probation, behavioral health, uh, uh, Calaveras Health and Human Services, uh, CPS. Um, our SRO sits on that board uh, along with other staff members. Um, that helps keep the kids in line. If, if they're not continuing going to school, um, they can be SARBed. If the parents aren't making the kids go to school, they can be sarved. The, the parents can actually be fined and or put in jail if they don't follow through because it's contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Next slide, please. Um, the coordination with uh, school site administrators. Um, in our dispatch center, we do have school maps the bell schedules, we have the bus schedules, we have all the safety plans already in place at our office. All the schools in Calaveras County have been working with us over numerous years, and this goes back when I started as an SRO back in 2005. We had them then, and we may have even had them before that. So when you hear that we don't have those plans and those um, maps and schedules in place, that's false. We do absolutely have those, and we have had them. Um, the sheriff office uh, works with the schools, so when they have lockdown drills and fire drills, they contact us so that we can be involved in it. Very important that we all work together as a team. Uh, the deputies do attend the drills. Um, after the uh, drills are done, they talk with the staff um, and the administrators and say, this is what we saw, this is where we need to improve things. 
Um, we are constantly giving them ideas to help improve the safety and response times, not only for us, but for them. Next slide, please. Uh, local school procedures um, at the incident start and who's notified and what happens. Again, we have those in place. We know the phone numbers to call. We know the people to contact. Um, the, the keys, uh, how's the staff report attendance, evacuation procedures, parent reunification plans. Um, uh, we do review all the school sites, the fences, the door locks, window coverings, uh, how the uh, staff reports unknown suspects on campuses. I remember when I was the SRO, we had a young man who was 18, he had graduated, and he kept coming back to the campus. School contacted me and we dealt with it. So those programs are in place to deal with those types of things. Next slide, please. Um, up on the very top, you can't read it, but it says there is no one emergency plan that fits all. We can set up the basis for what we plan on doing, but every different, every crisis is going to be a little different because we don't know what's going on. We could have a fire in one part of the school. We could have a fire in a different part of the school. If an active shooter comes on one part of the campus, it's going to be different than if they come through the front doors. So every incident is a little bit different. We, again, that's part of the planning process and working with the schools and training. The training is the biggest thing. We need to continue to train. We have been training and we will be upping those trainings. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, recognizing potential violence in the school. Uh, the Sheriff's Office is encouraging open lines of communication with school staff regarding recognizing and reporting ongoing issues. And it's not just the person that comes and walks onto campus, it's people that are in mental crisis and um, people, we as adults have a tendency to not pay attention to other people. And if we're not around somebody all the time, we don't know what their mannerisms are, we don't know how they act. The teachers and the students, our students that are in this school, they're with their friends all the time. Our staff, school staff, they see these kids all the time. And I have had staff members call me and say, hey, you might need to come and talk to Johnny because he's got something going on. He's not acting right. It kind of comes back to, I think, what we've talked about. Well, we haven't talked here, but I've said in the past, the new rule of thumb since our Florida is if you see something, say something. If your kids see that their, their uh, friend or their buddy or whatever or their girlfriend or boyfriend is having a bad day and things just don't seem right, we need to encourage our kids to tell a staff member or tell us as the parents, they need to tell somebody because the people that are doing these types of crimes that we're seeing in our country, they don't just all of a sudden snap. It builds up. They, they have a, there's something going on in their background that we don't know about and it builds up and we need to start paying attention and recognizing that and giving us that issue. One of the things that we've done at the sheriff's office is we just secured a grant, and this is brand new news, nobody's even heard this, not even my deputies. We've just secured a grant for two mental health workers that work in our jails and they work out in the public. Um, I don't know if anybody went to the candidates night last night, but I talked a little bit about that, that we need to help the people that are having a mental crisis before they get to the jail, before we take them to the hospital. So we've secured this grant to where we're going to be able to bring two people in that will be able to come out and work with adults and children that are in crisis. So that's going to give our school districts another avenue to help hopefully remedy some of the mental health crises that we're in, incurring right now. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what is our goal? Uh, a school and police partnership. That's the bottom line. Um, working together to develop realistic school safety plans in response to various threats, uh, conduct joint school and police training sessions and cost procedures, and conduct, conduct joint school and police field training exercises in a realistic environment with uh, maximum sensory overload. It's three-dimensional training. It's on, on view training. Next slide, please. This kind of shows we did some uh, training with our SWAT team up here. We typically do this um, 
like this time of year when we don't have kids in school or during the summer break when there's no sports or anything going on, we do come up and we use the campus so that we can do our trainings so that we, being on the SWAT team, we know what we're doing, we know where we're going, and we work with the schools during these trainings. Uh, as you can see, the bus in the bottom right-hand corner down here, we also do assaults on buses. So if we have a hostage situation on a bus. So we do practice these things. You might not see us practicing these, but we do do these practices. We do do these trainings. Um, next slide, please. Uh, planning an active shooter incident. Um, because active shooter situations are over within 10 to 15 minutes before law enforcement arrives on scene, individuals must prepare both mentally and physically to deal with the active shooter situation. Uh, next slide. This is it. Again, you can't see it real well, but it talks about evacuate, hideout, and fighting. Those are the three things that we tr we're going to start training more consistently with the schools so that they have a plan. Uh, the benefit that this school has is that we're close to downtown, the sheriff's office. Uh, we have schools that are a little more rural. We have you know West Point, Railroad Flat, Valley Springs, and even down into Jenny Lind. It takes us a little bit longer to get there depending on what's going on that particular day. But trust me, if there's a call out of school, every cop along with CHP and anybody that is available is going to be heading that direction. But the schools need to be prepared to know how to evacuate, how to hide out, and how to fight back if need be. So that's part of the trainings that we will be doing with them. Next slide. It also talks about what to expect and how to respond when in, uh, law enforcement arrives. Um, people people t have to understand from a law enforcement standpoint, when we come running into an area, whether it's at a school, movie theater, wherever it's at, if there's an active shooter or there's some type of a critical incident going on, we're running towards that. And I, I've heard people say when they see the kids walking down the side of the walkway or the roads with their hands on top of their heads because the cops are being mean to them, you have to understand we don't know who the shooter is and we have to not only protect ourselves, but we need to be able to protect everybody else that we're trying to get out of that site. So if these kids have their hands on their heads, we know that they don't have a gun in their hand, so they're probably going to be safe. And they're going to be looked at to make sure it's, it's a real life situation if the young man or young woman or whoever it is that has a gun walks by us because they're just trying to blend in. People don't think that happens, but it absolutely does. So there's reasons why we do that. But this here, when you come onto a scene, whether you're the parent or whether you're kids or whether it's staff, you need to understand what you may see. It's, it's reality and it's something that we have to deal with, unfortunately. Next slide. Staff members, kids, this is something we can train our kids to do. Pay attention. Um, I know that my daughter, if I ask her what somebody wore during the day, she'll tell you. you know, especially girls. Girls pay attention to what somebody's wearing. But we need to get our kids to focus on what they see. Uh, uh, are they wearing glasses? What color is their hair? Are they, are they bald? Do they have a knife, the clothing description, hats, what colors are shirt? Do they have a gun? Is it a long gun? Is it a small handgun? Most kids know the difference. And if they don't, it's something that we should probably teach them so that they do know, not to be able to use them, but to be able to recognize them if some type of incident does occur. Next slide, please. And this is our rapid response and deployment. Uh, this is our policy. The Sheriff's Office has this policy available. It's uh, our policy 424. It's something that we have in place and we have had in place for many, many years. Um, it talks about how we are going to respond to an active shooter and or a critical incident. So this, again, is something that the Sheriff's Office has in place. Uh, next slide. Again, this is just a continuation of rapid response and deployment. Law enforcement's purpose is to stop the active shooter as soon as possible. That's why we go in directly. The shooting that they just had in Maryland here uh, earlier this week, um, or the end of last week, I forget where it was, but two kids got shot. The SRO was on duty. He went in and he shot the bad guy. Um, he did his job. Did he save lives? We have to think that he did. Unfortunate that we lost two lives, but it could have been worse. 
but because we had somebody on scene, it, it changed the outcome more than likely. My SRO, my school resource officer, is trained in ALICE training. Let me see if I can remember the training, and if I can't, Sean, you can help me out. It's um, alert, lockdown, inform, help, counter. counter, and evacuate. So it's a program that our school resource officer has done. He's been working with the schools. In fact, I was here a while back when they had some training to teach staff about ALICE and how it works. So there are plans in place, and we are implementing them and continually moving forward with that. Uh, we now move to Mark Campbell, who is the uh, superintendent of the Calaveras Unified School District and former principal of this very high school. And former student of this very high school as well. Uh, thank you for coming, by the way. And, and this is an impressive turnout. You know, whether, whether you think so or not, it really is. And it shows that how committed you are to being more, more educated, more informed, and more involved. So thank you for this. And thank you for the, the panel as well for being here, especially the students on their spring break. That, that's phenomenal. So uh, Sheriff DiBasilio really covered a lot of the ground in terms of the partnerships that, that we have. And, and those are extremely important partnerships. And, and, and they were in place before Columbine in 1999, but they really, really ramped up in intensity as a result of that. And that's really when what used to be just the, the fire drills and the evacuations really took on a whole new light in terms of what we needed to do to be prepared. That really was a game changer, uh, Columbine, back in 99. And ever since, and as the sheriff had mentioned, we have had plans in place. We review them. We update them. We obviously want to be more consistent. And, and when something happens as tragic as Columbine or Parkland or what just happened in Maryland, that ramps up the, the, the intensity level with which we want to make sure that we're prepared. And a lot of this is being is the preparation to be proactive, but also also reactive. So there, there are a number of things that we have had in place, that we have in place, but we also never ever just kind of rest on what we have in place. We're constantly trying to fine tune it. Uh, and when I look at the plans that we have in place at every school site, uh, it, it includes both the, the reactive and, and the proactive side. It definitely includes the partnerships, and not just with law enforcement, but with all of our first responders. It's partnerships with behavioral health and mental health uh, and all of our county agencies, again, trying to serve the, our, the needs of our students and our families, the social, emotional, the behavioral needs in advance, but also during an event, after an event. We rely on those community partnerships working with our staff to serve the needs. From a law enforcement perspective, again, being prepared. And, and as the sheriff noted, it, and you saw it in Parkland, you know, probably one of the most highly prepared and organized and set up facilities and schools to be prepared and still the, that, the level of tragedy that happened there happened. No, no matter how prepared you are, you can't fully prevent it, but you can be as prepared as possible to mitigate some, some of, of the damage. And that's what, really what we're all about, which is why we involve law enforcement and first responders to make sure that we're aligned, to make sure that our students know what to do, to make sure that when we identify gaps, and there are always gaps in any system, it's never going to be perfect, but that we're addressing them to the best of our ability with the resources that we have. So plans in place, constant review, making sure staff and students are aware, working with law enforcement, again, proactive and, and reactive. We also, at, at the site level and district level, there, there are safety committees at the district level. Thank you, Mr. Rebstock, for being on that committee. Looking, what are the priorities at school sites? What are the priorities as a district? What do we have the resources to, to fund? Where can we find additional resources if we need to address certain areas? And I'll talk more about funding in a little bit. At the school site level, we have many discipline committees uh, where they're focused on what can we do to strengthen our, our behavior management system? What can we do to, to strengthen our discipline system? We're working really hard to do, and it's called PBIS, Positive Behavior Intervention and Support. It's not a new thing, uh, but it's something that we're, we're really trying to incorporate at the district level, consistency, district-wide, especially TK-8, uh, trying to build in th those early interventions and supports so that we're effectively handling our disciplinary situations, but we're also addressing our students before it gets to the point where we might be concerned about a, a, a real large-scale disciplinary situation. These things are, are constantly reviewed by, by staff, and, and you need to know, and I, this is not just true for CUSD, because I know we have some people from other districts here. Everybody who comes to work every day, it, their, their job is to, not just to teach your children, is to protect your children, to serve your children, to feed them, transport them, counsel them, guide them. Uh, it, you have many eyes and ears on, on our campuses, both students and staff, working really hard to create a, a, a community. Every, every one of our schools is a community. So when, when we talk about 
all the, the drills, and we talk about the plans, and we talk about things that we have in place, we're also focused every day on making sure that the schools are the safest place for your kids to be, and not just physical safety, but mental and emotional. And so our principals and our staff, and classified and certificated, are working hard to create that, 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 that culture, that community, where, where, where students trust the adults. They know they can go to an adult. They know if they, if they see something, they can say something and something will be done. And that's just kind of what, what we have been about and what we continue to be about because if you have that in place and you have at, at the high school, you know, that's over 900 sets of eyes and ears. It, the hypersensitive, hyper alert, hyper aware because in this day and age you have to be. And if you see something and you say something and you know something will be done, that in itself creates a sense of community. That in itself creates a sense of safety uh, that, that we're, we are all in this together. So it, it's, it's addressing issues after they happen. It's being prepared for issues before they happen. Uh, everything that we do takes time, takes people, and it takes money. And we, we, have a lot, we have a lot of people, we don't have a lot of time, and we certainly don't have a lot of money. So a lot of what this is, does when federal grants and state grants and money starts coming to the schools because when something tragic happens like happened in Parkland, you start to see m money flow to, to whatever degree is, is, is possible. When that happens, we want to be in a position to, to maximize that at, at the county level, at the county education level, at the school district level. We know that we could use work on our facilities. We know that we could use work, and I know that the, the students will mention this, we, with communications systems. We could use work on our facilities with windows, window coverings. We are talking about, and, and there are pros and cons to the next two items, but when you talk about fencing off schools and you talk about installing security cameras at schools, and, and not just the, the cost factor, which, which, which is significant, but there's a whole philosophical piece that goes with that as well. But with due diligence, we, we're going to explore what it would cost to, to move forward in, in, in that area, uh, if, if, if that's the answer. And if so, that requires funding, and we're going to have to seek external sources of funding in order to make that happen. And that will in involve a lot of dialogue and, and a lot of work. But we're in a good position because we can't do it alone as a school district. We can't do it without you. We can't do it without our partners in the, in, the, in the county. But everybody working together to do the best we can with the resources that we have to create and provide a safe place for your students every, every day is, is what we wake up to do every day. And, and so I, I take great comfort knowing that we have had and will continue to have tremendous partnerships uh, and that also that, that people like you are here and you're involved and ideally as we do more of these meetings and have more of these discussions, people will be more informed uh, and, and will be better equipped to work on this together. Thank you, Mark. Uh, we now have the Calaveras County Superintendent of Schools, back-to-back uh, -back superintendents. Uh, this is, this is uh, Scott Hello, everybody, and thank you for being here today. I want to especially thank Kate for arranging this. She put us all together and got us thinking, and um, thank you for your efforts. It's extremely heartwarming to us when we see the community get involved in these issues because this can't be a school, law enforcement, parent, separate identity. We have to work together or we're never going to solve this issue. Um, you heard a little bit about the plans that are all developed. One of the county office's roles is to make sure they're done. So we have the all superintendents certify that their plans are done every year, um, and that has to come through my office to ensure that they're done. If they're not, then when I report them up to the state superintendent of the schools. So those plans are very important because they drive everything that happens as far as school safety, from an animal being on campus to, a, uh, to an active shooter, all, everywhere in between. Natural disasters, the whole thing is covered in there. Most plans at school sites are two inches thick or more, um, the good news is that we part of those down to about a uh, 12 to 15 page leaflet that every teacher has access to so they know all the procedures and how things work. The name of the game here is prevention. That's the biggest piece that we can do. Um, as part of that, the uh, county office developed emergency mental health protocols for all the school administrators and counselors to use throughout the county so that if they have a student in crisis, they, can, they know how to do a threat assessment, they know procedures, they know how to reach out to mental health, the law enforcement, to make sure that student gets the help they need to prevent any type of any major incident going further. Um, that's a real important key because without those things in place, um, we're, we're at whim to what comes through our doors. Um, all of the county uh, schools um, have the we tip uh, brochures which I put out there that's a tip line it's hundred percent anonymous anybody can use it not just students but parents too, friends whoever in the county 
um, to alert the schools of what's going on. So they keep you totally anonymous, but there is a reward system, and everybody goes, well, if I'm anonymous, how do I get a reward? Um, they will give you a special, unique ID name um, when you call in, and that's the name that's reported um, to be used in the public, but you, your personal information is never accessible. So they can validate it's a legitimate report, so the law enforcement ends can, can act on that, but it keeps, your, your, um, keeps you totally anonymous and provides a way for to things to be reported. And that's everything from vandalism to, hey, my kid saw something on Facebook I don't like. Um, please report that stuff. Uh, social media is a big one out there today. That's how most of these things are coming to light, um, and they come to light rather rapidly. Uh, as schools administrators will tell you, it's normally at 5 o'clock when you're trying to get home for the day that things start blowing up, because that's when kids get home and jump on the computers. We live in a very connected world, and I want to say that um, you all have students, and you know how quickly they communicate on their phones. So if a crisis do goes down at school, you're most likely going to hear about it from your own kid or a friend's kid before you're going to hear about it from the school. And know that's the reality. The last thing you want is a school administrator running around and trying to get messages to you when they're in the middle of a crisis. I promise you, as soon as things slow down and as soon as they can put together a message that makes sense and keep you informed, they will do so. But right in the middle of an incident, their job is to keep your kids safe. And that they will do that to their utmost ability. And uh, many of them will go down even trying to protect them. So be aware of that. You're not going to get that fast communication of what's going on. Um, Rick will, re will back this up. The last thing we want you to do is show up on campus. You start getting those text messages. You start getting that information. Please don't come to the campus. I know it's hard as a parent. I've had, I have two kids myself. Slow down. Think about how, what that is going to do to the atmosphere or may put yourself in danger, may put other people in danger if you're coming to that campus. So slow down and wait for guidance. The school will reach out and tell you where you can unify with kids, how the procedures are. Um, just stay back a little bit and not be so quick to emotionally jump in. Um, and I know that is a big ask. Um, one of the things that we've said, and it says it on this brochure, but 93% of these school shootings, they've told somebody else, at least one person. 73% of them told two people. Those are the people that got to reach out. So you can't, you can't second guess yourself. You can't second guess the person making the comments anymore. You need to reach out and say, this is what I heard. This is what I was told. Let the professionals then take over and do the investigation part. We just can't wait for it to happen. And we want to focus on, on, on training and practices and drills because that's how we get things to be better. Uh, the county office is co-sponsoring what we call MTSS, multi-tiered system of support grants. That's helping to fund some of the PBIS work that the districts are doing so that we can be a support to them. We help co-write grants, we help find grants. Um, and help track, track down money so that we can be a support for what things need to happen. Thanks again for all being here. Thank you, Scott. Uh, next, we have uh, the Deputy Director of Behavioral and Mental Health in Calaveras County, David Sackman. I'd like to quickly comment on this subject, however. I, I spent eight years on the Mental Health Board here in Calaveras County. There's been a lot of discussion nationally about mental health and, and its relation to school safety. My hope is that listening to David, we can understand how to be compassionate without stigmatizing things and at the same time get safer in, our, in the way we deal with it. Uh, David? Thanks, Steve. I'd also like to thank Kate for organizing this. That, uh, it's really great to have the opportunity to talk with the community. Um, and in Calaveras County Behavioral Health, we provide uh, community-based mental health services. We have a 24-7 crisis line, so in, if anybody's experiencing a mental health crisis, they can call us any time. There's a couple of handouts that are on the, front, on the tables as you are coming in, picking up the agenda, that talk about what we, the services that we provide at our clinic and also the programs that we provide funding for <clears throat> that are in the community and in our schools. Um, we also have our, a lot of prevention that 
there's a lot of prevention services that are funded through the Mental Health Services Act and also our substance abuse prevention and treatment block grant funds um, that are in the schools and in the community. Um, as Scott said, we worked out a procedure with them, with the schools so that uh, they could get access to us easily and we could intervene and help with them uh, with mental health crises. And also the follow-up. The follow-up was a big piece that we really needed to work out, and uh, we've worked that out. In general, we provide what's called specialty mental health services for persons with Medi-Cal, um, which is voluntary mental health services, which are include counseling, medication services, um, supportive services that are referred to as case management, or we'll help people identify resources that they might need to help them stabilize their living situation. Because as we know, your living situation affects your mental health. Um, I'm not going to get into the details of, of our system. It's pretty complex. Um, but know that if you do, if you do need help, uh, you can always give us a call and we can figure out what kinds of services we can get, get you connected to and, and help you deal with a crisis in the meantime. Um, one issue that's come up, uh, doing a lot of thinking, uh, people are quick to throw around the term mental health. All these people have mental health, are mentally ill. And really, I'd like to make a difference. There's a difference between emotional disturbance and severe mental illness. And I would say that all the shooters that, are, that I've read about appear to be very emotionally disturbed. Um, that doesn't mean that they have a severe mental illness. Um, but it's, you know, it's kind of hard to sort that out. Um, with the way that our system is set up, it's much easier for us to serve uh, persons under age 21 with severe emotional disturbance um, as opposed to severe mental illness because then you get into a, a cool conversation about insurances and insurance coverage and we just don't need to go there. Um, I agree with um, what Scott said and what other folks have said was really focusing on prevention. I, um, one of the easiest ways, one of the most common characteristics all these shooters have is that they're disconnected from society and they're isolated. And if you've ever been isolated and we've all had moments of feeling isolation, you kind of know how your brain gets on a hamster wheel and starts spinning and it usually doesn't go in a very good direction, um, you know, either not necessarily saying you're going to harm somebody else or you're going to harm yourself, it generally, you don't think yourself out of that, out of that bad situation. And I can sure we can all think of times when we were feeling bad and we talked to a friend or somebody and they helped us see something that we couldn't see. And these, uh, I'm, my impression is that these people that are doing these school shootings are trapped on the hamster wheel and don't have people to talk to. And um, I know we had a school count, uh, counselor that was on the school sites for many years. He just recently retired and he and I talked a lot about things and he made a, always made a point of talking to the kids that were isolated and sitting off by themselves because those are the kids that we know that are at risk for a lot of things. They might be at risk for being a school shooter or they might be at risk for hurting themselves, or they might just be at risk of not fulfilling their potential. Um, I think when you really see the problem and the, the danger is when somebody's disconnected and isolated and angry. And a lot of times, uh, you know, they're ang people are angry because they've been bullied, because they perceive their isolation, they feel cut out, um, they're on the hamster wheel and they're seeing everybody is against them and not seeing, uh, seeing any evidence to the contrary. Um, persons, uh, and, I mean, the thing that they have in common with persons with severe mental illness is a lot of times they're not really aware that their thinking is going uh, in a bad way and that uh, it's, they may not be, they're not perceiving the world, you know, what I call, might call common reality. They're, they're seeing it in a different way. And generally it's in a, a negative way where they feel cut out. And uh, if we see that, those are, you know, 
we've seen everybody, any teacher, uh, when I used to provide services in schools, I mean, you could, any teachers, can, they can point out which kids are at risk because they see them every day and they, they, they know the signs. You know, um, and that's why it's really important for us uh, in behavioral health to partner with the schools and, and we are doing that. Um, a couple things that if people are wondering what they can do, there's a great youth mentoring program that's always looking for mentors, particularly for young men. Uh, we do have a prevention coalition and also, as Steve mentioned, we have the mental health board. If the mental health is an, an area of interest of yours, there's always room on the mental health board. And you can at least attend the meetings and find out what's going on. Um, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, the student voice is very important in this equation, and we're lucky tonight to have two. Uh, we have Emily Smith, who will be followed by Tyler and I hope I'm getting this right. Uh, Hamry? Hamry. Hamry. It's pretty close. All right, close but no cigar. Uh, looking forward to these presentations because anything we do must of necessity involve our students and our kids. So just to give a little context, during class we actually had the Alice presentation, which was uh, this teachers explaining exactly what Alice was and what the plan of action is for any sort of a violent situation and how we should react to it. So, of course, it was rather long, so to sum it up, there was run, fight, hide. And of course, every situation is different, so you can't say in your mind, oh, I'm gonna go with the run option every single time. That's part of where our realistic and different situations come in. So for the run, they were very clear in establishing your extraction zones where police would be able to come and provide assistance to the students, make sure they're safe. Uh, they're actually all around our campus, depending on which section of the campus you're located in. And then obviously they're not promoting, hey, if there's a school shooter in the uh, front area, please don't go down to the extraction zone over there. That does not make any sense. So they're very clear in expressing the different locations available. And for the fight, the fight really hasn't been established yet. That's something that, that's something that we can hope to expand on. But they also talk about hiding, how to barricade uh, the room in order to make sure. So obviously, if there's a school shooter right outside the door, that's not a situation where you're able to, uh, to go ahead and run out and go to an extraction zone. So with all this in mind, shortly after, we actually had our first um, lockdown drill with a uh, school shooter. Um, so when recently this happened, uh, what what we did was uh, there was a drill during the morning break, which um, is just when all the students are out of class, and they did the drill. Um, and as you could think, all of these students dispersed. They just wanted to get the heck out of there. And um, uh, we noticed that uh, on the loudspeaker, they kind of said that there was a drill, and they um, said the shooter is in this area of the school. Since um, uh, they weren't able to hear it outside, many of the students actually ran in that direction. And so um, there are definitely things that we need to work on, and um, definitely things that we need to kind of focus on um, with uh, up and coming drills. So although we've only done technically one school shooter drill, the main purpose of it is what can we learn from this? Because it was relatively chaotic for our first one, as it should be, because we've only done one. That makes sense. But from a student's perspective, I would say the number one key thing we need to work on is communication. Because depending on where you are on the campus, it can be incredibly hard trying to listen to your PA system. So what actually happened from that school shooter drill is I would take it that some students didn't hear clearly, and they ran to the extraction zones. However, in this situation, our <coughs> school shooter was in, um, in front of the pack here. And uh, I would say above 60 students just ran this way. So if this were a real life situation, there would have been a lot of fatalities, unfortunately. But this, again, just shows us that if our PA systems improve, then that helps communication all around and will hopefully uh, protect a lot of the students. And then drills. This is something that a lot of students and staff feel pretty similar about because we've talked about them in our classrooms, which is also really nice that we can have that relationship with our teacher and our classmates, feeling protective <coughs> enough to where we can um, express our views. We'd like to have a lot more drills in the future to prepare with different situations because like we said, it's not gonna be the same thing every single time, which is gonna result in a different outcome. So obviously some might be announced, some might not be announced because you have to have the <coughs> adrenaline factor. It's easy to tell anyone what to do, but if you're in that situation, your heart's gonna be pumping and your mind might be all jumbled. So it'd be good to practice uh, that real life 
kind of situations. And then besides that, the only other thing that I know from my perspective as a student is in the classroom, how can we barricade? What is the most, what is the best way to barricade ourselves? Because there's a lot of chairs, you know, books and whatnot, but there's other measures that can be taken to prevent a school shooter from entering the classroom. Like one of my favorites that uh, we haven't really gone over yet is like taking your belt off and uh, applying it to the I don't know what you call it, the, the lever that opens the door, that, that's a great way to start because it would prevent a school shooter from actually being able to open the door. Or the fire extinguisher, for example, you pull that sucker off the wall, you aim at their eyes, if they come in, they'll go blind because of the chemicals and the type of fire extinguisher it is. So these basic preventative measures that students can be aware of will hopefully save a lot of lives should this ever happen. Um, I know uh, going over the drills would be really important because uh, everyone is going to respond differently and wherever they are at, um, you know, in different situations, say if, it, if they know about it in a week in advance, they're going to be like, oh, okay, on Monday we're going to have a, a drill, so, you know, uh, get ready for that. Um, and if it's unannounced, it's just going to be like, whoa, okay, what's happening? Um, I think that that kind of shows that the BA system needs to be fixed before we can really um, go forward with this because uh, having students know that this is a drill would be a, a very, very crucial, um, at least in my eyes, because you know there might it might be more chaotic, it might be um, a less chaotic depending on uh, you know what position they're in. Um, and it's gonna, it's not gonna work for every situation. And I think that that also kind of is where drills and learning those kind of self-defense uh, skills that Tyler was talking about. How can we protect ourselves when we're in a classroom? Uh, rather than, okay, how can we protect ourselves when we're in a classroom, but we know that the shooter is across the campus? Um, would we be able to just go to the nearest exit? Um, so that's kind of our, our look on things and uh, that's what we've seen so far, and so we hope that there will be more drills and more opportunities for the um, system to improve. Thank you, Emily and Tyler. Uh, seems to me, just hearing that, that we must be doing something right here in Calaveras County. That's uh, two articulate folks. Uh, when I was 18 and asked to speak in front of a group, uh, my knees buckled and my voice stammered, and I couldn't remember what I came to say. So. Uh, Hats off to both of you. Uh. <laughs>